Today is a sacred day, obviously. September 11th, eight years ago, um, marked an attack on our nation that we need to pay tribute to and recognize and think about for a moment. So I'm going to ask you to join me in a moment of silence as we think about those who sacrificed their lives and the friends that we had and renew our resolve to understand evil and never be silenced by such attacks. Thank you very much. The mission of the Kirby Center, like the college, is educational. And as we teach citizens about the enduring principles of the Constitution, the Kirby Center seeks to inspire citizens, including students, scholars, and statesmen, to act worthy of the blessings of liberty. We welcome you to join us as we continue this lecture series and move around Washington until we open our new building across the street from this building in September 2010. Bring a friend, enjoy the fellowship, become part of our subculture, and uh, next month our lecture will be on Friday, October 2nd with Heritage Foundation's uh, Matthew Spaulding, who has a great book coming out about first principles. He's also an adjunct professor with Hillsdale, and will be at Ebenezer's Coffee House around the corner from here. Ambassador John Bolton has pulled a larger audience today than we usually have. I encourage everybody to come on in. There's plenty of seats over here, by the way. So just come on in and grab a seat if you can. Um, Ambassador Bolton is a loyal friend a principled strong leader for American interests from both when he's both inside the government and outside the government working. He's an able skilled lawyer, a diplomat, he's been at senior levels in the government at the Justice Department, at the State Department, at USAID, he's been at law firms around town at senior levels, he's served as Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security from 2001 to 2005. Then he served as the U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations. Very busy time, very horrible place, <laughs> horrible people. But anyway, he endured it well until uh, 2006 when Senate Democrats and at least one irritating Republican I can remember kept him from serving any longer in that post. AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, is fortunate to have him as a senior fellow, he wrote a compelling insider tale about the policy battles that if you haven't read, you should pick up. Surrender is not an option. And uh, today he's promised to grade President Obama's foreign policy as it's unfolded so far. He will speak to us for about 30 minutes. He'll take questions. At the end, we'll end at 8.45 so you can go on your way. Uh, before you ask questions, please identify yourself and wait for the microphone. Please join me in a warm welcome for John Bolton. Well, Jenny, th thank you very much for those uh, kind words of introduction, and thanks to all of you for um, coming out, as she said, on a, uh, on, on a rainy Friday in Washington. Uh, and I think it is... Uh, uh, important since it's the eighth anniversary of uh, the attacks of 9-11 uh, to take a look at where our foreign policy is and uh, to judge uh, whether we're on a path to uh, becoming safer or on a path in the other direction. And I think it's important in that regard uh, that we not be uh, intimidated by those who say that criticism of foreign policy uh, or defense policy that implies we're less safe as a consequence of certain policies being adopted is somehow disloyal or unfair or hyperpartisan. Uh, it is the essence of uh, political debate uh, in the foreign policy arena to judge whether the interests of the United States are being protected and advanced. Uh, and when we conclude, sadly, uh, that they're not, I think it's our responsibility uh, to speak out. And those who try and say that comparison with uh, levels of safety in the past is uh, unfair and appropriate, I think have it very badly wrong. I think uh, it's, it's also important to understand that uh, for the last uh, nearly eight months now, we've had a very different kind of president uh, than we've had in the past. Uh, I call Barack Obama the first 
post-American president. Uh, and by that, I don't mean he's anti-American at all. I think he recognizes that the United States has legitimate interests in the world. Of course, so do 190 plus other nations have legitimate interests. And he wants them to work out. And that's fine if you're an academic at some university, but it's a very unusual view for a president of the United States. I think there's a lot of evidence about why Barack Obama is uh, a post-American uh, president, but I'll try and sum it up in just uh, one response to a question that he gave in Europe on his trip a few months ago. When a reporter uh, said, uh, Mr. President, a lot of people have said, uh, have commented on your uh, unwillingness to uh, discuss American exceptionalism, uh, the, the view of America that your predecessors have had that uh, uh, the United States has, a, has had a unique mission in uh, world history, that it's a city on a hill, as uh, the Pilgrim uh, Father said, or a shining city on a hill in Ronald Reagan's uh, amendation or a new Jerusalem or any of a variety of, uh, uh, of uh, phrases that have been used to embody the concept of American exceptionalism. And the reporter said, Mr. President, do you believe in American exceptionalism? Now, this answer from the President is extremely important to understand, both what he said in the first couple of words and then what he said in the rest of the sentence. He starts off by saying, well, yes, I believe in American exceptionalism uh, in the same way that the British believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. Now, let's take the first part of the sentence. He says, I believe in American exceptionalism. So for anybody else who wants to know whether or not he does or question it, as I'm about to do, uh, he can point to those first few words. But look at the remaining two clauses in the sentence, He's, where he goes on to say, just as the British people believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. There are 192 countries, members of the United Nations. I'm sure the President could have gone on another 189 times with countries that believe in their own exceptionalism. And it leads unmistakably to the conclusion, of course, that if everybody's exceptional, then nobody's exceptional. So, you know, we Americans have this belief in our exceptionalism, but so do the British and the Greeks and the Burmese and the Zimbabweans and the Ecuadorians and everybody else. And it's a, it's a nice thing to have, a belief in exceptionalism. But it reflects that he just fundamentally doesn't think America is any different uh, from anyone else. Uh, and indeed, it goes to the question, I think, of how the president sees uh, his role in uh, not just our foreign policy, but the world as a whole. And he hasn't said this, but there was an unbelievably telling comment made by uh, Newsweek editor Evan Thomas when the president spoke at the anniversary of uh, the D-Day landings in Normandy. And uh, he said at the end of the quote describing uh, President Obama's speech, he, uh, Evan Thomas said, I mean, in a way, Obama's standing above the country, above, above the world. He, he's sort of God. He's going to bring all different sides together. Okay, uh, so let's be clear. The president didn't say that about himself, but his loyal media followers were saying it about him. And the, I'll leave the God part out, but the part about standing above country, I think, really sums up uh, a lot of what uh, he thinks. It's a question of working out uh, America's legitimate interest with everybody else's legitimate interest. And we'll see in a couple of weeks when the President uh, chairs a meeting of the Security Council at the head of government level uh, how he approaches that. Th this is the classic standing above the world model. And I can tell you from the protocol of the Security Council, He'll say, I, rec I give the floor to the President of the Republic of France. You know, how gracious of him. And the, Republic of Fr the President, uh, Sarkozy, will say, Merci, Monsieur le Président, and, and then he'll compliment him on how wonderful he is. And we'll have a couple of hours of Barack Obama being above the world. 
presiding over the Security Council. Now, there may be a few bumps in the road here when Libya, which is on the Security Council and the person of Muammar Gaddafi, comes up to give the President a copy of the Green Book and shake his hand, give him a little fraternal hug. They may have to decide how that's going to work out. But this is, again, emblematic of a very distinctive view uh, of America's role in the world and the role of the President. It's not that other candidates for president haven't shared this view, but it's the first candidate for president who ever got elected. If you go back, for example, to 1988, uh, then Vice President George Bush uh, said of his Democratic opponent, Michael Dukakis, that uh, Governor Dukakis considers America to be another pleasant country uh, on the United Nations roll call, somewhere out there between Albania and Zimbabwe. Uh, that's a view uh, by Governor Dukakis, I think, not much different from President Obama. Now, Vice President Bush went on to say, I see America as the leader, a unique nation with a special role in the world. That, there's another definition of, uh, or another description of American exceptionalism, uh, which I don't think we're going to hear a lot of from the President. So when you look at uh, the policies that this administration pursues in a, in a wide variety of circumstances, I think you have to start with the understanding uh, of Barack Obama as the first post-American president. And then a lot of other uh, aspects of his policies that are otherwise uh, somewhat inexplicable come into play. And I think we're going to see this in a, in a wide variety of contexts. Uh, you know, next week I am told at a very senior level, administration officials will be uh, meeting to decide whether to re-sign the Rome Statute that created the International Criminal Court. Uh, this was something that uh, uh, was negotiated during the Clinton administration, signed by President Clinton, even though he never sent it to the Senate to, uh, to be ratified. In the Bush administration, we unsigned the treaty because we thought it was uh, harmful not only to American interests around the world, but because it was a fundamentally illegitimate effort uh, to create a prosecutorial and judicial authority sort of floating out in the international system. I think there's strong reason to believe that if this administration thinks that it can avoid a lot of criticism, uh, it will attempt to rejoin the International Criminal Court. Interestingly, just as the prosecutor uh, is announcing that he's beginning to try and uh, decide whether he has jurisdiction over allegations of NATO war crimes in Afghanistan. Uh, so, uh, a, a not a terribly propitious moment for the administration to be thinking about it, but it shows the direction that I think uh, they'd like to go in if they thought they could carry it off. Um, in, a, in a variety of uh, more uh, traditional foreign policy contexts, I think we can see that the uh, administration really uh, in, in many senses, uh, is, is pursuing a policy that uh, I think can accurately be uh, described as neo-isolationist. And in that, it harks back to a long tradition within the Democratic Party uh, of an unwillingness to be assertive in the world in defense of American interests and values and those of our friends and allies. Uh, being a, a, a baby boomer, of course, I well recall George McGovern's acceptance speech to the 1972 Democratic uh, National Convention at the height of opposition to the Vietnam War. George McGovern's refrain then was, come home, America. Come home, America. Come home from Vietnam. Come home from a lot of other places as well. That is uh, an attitude that I think we see uh, playing out now, not entirely formed, I wouldn't want to suggest that, but certainly uh, uh, evolving in that direction. Let's start with uh, the case of Iraq, where I think the administration is determined to pull out American forces along the uh, lines of the plan that was uh, actually uh, decided at the end of the Bush administration without regard to the internal situation inside Iraq, even as American forces have pulled back from uh, prominent roles in the major urban areas of Iraq and violence has increased, the administration remains fixed on the withdrawal schedule because it's the withdrawal that matters, not the political stability 
uh, inside Iraq, and not the implications of American withdrawal for the balance of power in the Persian Gulf uh, region. I think, if anything, we'll try and see the administration uh, speed up the pace of withdrawal, uh, and I think uh, that that pursuit of the uh, exit timetable without regard to the political and military consequences on the ground in Iraq could have a very uh, harmful impact on our interests, not only in Iraq, but in, in the broader region as well. We can see in the case of Afghanistan that there's uh, considerable debate within the Democratic Party about whether further troop increases uh, should be required. Uh, now, I, th I think there's legitimate room for discussion about what exactly our strategic objectives are uh, in Afghanistan, and I, for one, am worried about a uh, strategic objective that includes making the country a stable, prosperous, democratic society. We're not going to make Afghanistan into Switzerland. We're not even going to make it into Honduras. Our strategic interest is uh, making sure that Taliban and al-Qaeda don't use any part of the country for uh, a base to launch terrorist attacks elsewhere in the world. Uh, perfecting the Afghan political system is something we can safely leave uh, to the Afghans. But the notion that what was once the good war for the left of the Democratic Party has now become just another war that they'd, uh, that they'd like to get out of, I think is going to be a very difficult problem for the president to uh, wrestle with, uh, and, and the path that he takes is going to be significant, because in the case of Afghanistan, the consequences of our decisions there will have important ramifications, not necessarily dispositive, but important ramifications in Pakistan, uh, where I think our interests uh, are even more acute and where the risks, uh, the potential risks to the United States and our friends around the world are even graver. If radical Islamicists uh, are able to create conditions of chaos inside Pakistan that enables them to take control of the government, they will uh, immediately come into control of a substantial arsenal of nuclear weapons, uh, which risks uh, increased conflict on the Indian subcontinent and also risks these weapons being delivered to terrorist groups uh, that would be an immediate threat to us worldwide. So the issue in Afghanistan uh, eight years after the attacks of 9-11 is not simply preventing al-Qaeda and Taliban from uh, returning to their safe havens, although that remains uh, a significant strategic objective. But the issue has enlarged uh, because of the cross-border nature of Taliban and al-Qaeda activities uh, to ensuring that Pakistan's nuclear capabilities don't fall into the wrong hands. And, how the administration handles that, I think, remains very much up in the air. Uh, more broadly, we know that the administration believes that its predecessor uh, didn't do enough negotiation uh, on issues like the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. And the administration has said uh, repeatedly, starting with the inaugural address, that it wants to hold out its hand to countries like North Korea and Iran in the hopes that they will unclench their fist, as the President said, and enter into negotiation. Now, this is, this is an interesting view of history. The Bush administration either directly negotiated or indirectly negotiated with Iran and North Korea for six and a half years. So it's not like negotiation wasn't tried, uh, uh, number one. Number two, negotiation is not a policy. <laughs> negotiation is a technique. Negotiation is a way of achieving your objectives. It doesn't tell you what the objective is. Uh, and a lot of the talk about negotiation that we've seen, whether it's in the context of Iran or North Korea or the famous reset button with Moscow or a variety of other contexts, do doesn't really tell you what happens after you shake hands and sit down at the table. Uh, and I think that reflects a kind of shallowness in the administration's approach to international affairs that doesn't give much comfort for the substantive outcome uh, that, we hope, uh, uh, that we hope to achieve. Uh, le let's look at these problems of, of North Korea and Iran, which along with Pakistan I think are the uh, most worrying aspects of the continuing struggle against uh, proliferation of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. In the case of North Korea, uh, we've seen the 
administration extend its hand. And in response, we've seen North Korea conduct its second nuclear test. Uh, in April of this year. Uh, we've seen further launches of ballistic missiles. We've seen the effective kidnapping uh, and incarceration of two American uh, reporters. Uh, and, and just within the past few days, we've seen evidence that North Korea is allowing flooding from dams inside North Korea uh, into South Korea, coupled with the typical North Korean PR campaign uh, to show that they actually want to come back to negotiations. All of this uh, demonstrates that, uh, that they didn't, you know, they didn't press the reset button in North Korea when Barack Obama was elected. Can you imagine that? The North Koreans are never going to be talked out of their nuclear weapons program. They see the nuclear weapons program as a trump card against the United States, against Japan and South Korea. It's the ultimate protection for the regime, and it's a source of revenue and uh, leverage elsewhere in the world, particularly in the Middle East. The North Koreans are happy to talk about their nuclear weapons program. They have been successful over the years in using negotiations to leverage uh, economic and political concessions from uh, their interlocutors. Uh, they've even been happy to pledge to give up nuclear weapons. By my count, they've done it now five times in the past 18 years. The only problem is that they never quite seem to get around to giving them up. and. Uh, uh, we, we've just seen again in the past uh, 10 days the North Koreans announcing that, uh, you know, actually they do have a uranium enrichment program. Despite the uh, efforts of many in the uh, United States to say, uh, uh, to argue to the contrary, even though going back to 2002 we had very uh, compelling evidence that North Korea had launched on a production <laughs> scope uh, procurement program for uranium enrichment, that they had benefited from the proliferation network of AQ Khan, uh, and that they were engaged in uh, extensive nuclear cooperation with Syria, building a reactor on the banks of the Euphrates River, uh, obviously not because of that long common cultural history they share with Syria, but because it's a very good place uh, for North Korea to hide evidence of its nuclear weapons program from prying international eyes. So I think the uh, odds favor the following scenario over the next year, North Korea is going to agree to negotiate. Why not? It's to their advantage to do so. It buys them more time. Uh, it increases the possibility of further uh, economic and political benefits. Uh, and it will, it will fundamentally satisfy the administration because they can say, we have brought North Korea back to the table. Now, that won't accomplish anything in reducing the nuclear threat that North Korea poses in Northeast Asia and around the world, but it will be enough uh, to take it off the table of, uh, uh, of uh, concern in the media uh, and thus for purposes of this administration solve the problem. Unfortunately, the threat of proliferation uh, posed by North Korea isn't only in Northeast Asia, as I mentioned. It does extend to the Middle East, where North Korea has been a major player over the years, uh, both in terms of nuclear cooperation and in uh, its supply and work on ballistic missile delivery systems for countries like uh, Iran, Saddam Hussein's Iraq, Syria, and others. And here in the case of uh, Iran, we have another example of how that extended hand uh, from the Obama administration hasn't quite worked out uh, the way the administration anticipated. Indeed, there's now at least uh, anecdotal evidence that the uh, uh, perception on the part of the regime in Tehran that the administration was so eager for negotiations it would overlook harsh steps internally. Uh, now seems to be borne out. And we've seen that in response to the administration's extended hand, uh, the, the, the mullahs in Tehran conducted a grossly fraudulent presidential election uh, on June the 12th and have spent the months since then uh, repressing their opponents, their adversaries, and uh, dissidents uh, with, in, inside Iran. In fact, uh, close observers of the situation in Iran think that uh, we're no longer in a struggle between uh, hardliners and moderates, if there were any moderates left, but that power is actually flowing away from the Ayatollahs uh, and toward the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, so that you're moving away from a theological autocracy toward a, uh, a, a, a theological military dictatorship. 
uh, obviously since it's the Revolutionary Guards Corps that has control of the nuclear weapons program uh, and control over principal funding for Iran's role as the central banker for international terrorism, every prospect is that Iran will grow uh, more dangerous uh, in the region and around the world as time goes on. And uh, so the administration's response uh, for the first eight months has been, we're going to try diplomacy with Iran. Unlike that Bush administration that wouldn't talk to its adversaries, we're going to talk to Iran. Uh, an interesting idea, complicated only by the fact Iran wouldn't talk to them. Uh, and so now we hear the administration saying, well, it may be that diplomacy isn't going to work, so we're going to rely on sanctions. Uh, we're going to go after Iran's vulnerability uh, because of its lack of refining capability for uh, petroleum products, and we're really going to squeeze them. Now, of course, this is what the Europeans and the Bush administration thought they were doing for the last seven years, too. It's why the Security Council passed three sanctions resolutions, which have essentially had no impact whatever uh, on Iran's ongoing nuclear weapons program. Uh, so the idea that we're going to get another sanctions resolution from the Security Council isn't one that I think realistic people would count on. And, you know, fortunately, you can always count on uh, the Russians, and especially Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, who said very clearly yesterday, we're not going to favor sanctions on Iran in the Security Council. So, so much for that idea. Falling back to Plan B, the Europeans, after seven years of hesitating, seven years of being unwilling to take strong steps, now the Europeans are going to impose strict sanctions. Well, uh, uh, I'll, I'll buy you all lunch on the day that happens. Uh, but even if the Europeans finally step up to the plate, uh, other countries around the world are going to take advantage of their absence. And we've already seen our good friend Hugo Chavez in Tehran agreeing to uh, substantial deliveries of refined petroleum products to Iran uh, and talking about nuclear cooperation with Iran, something very important for them given Venezuela's supplies of uranium in, in the ground uh, that are now available to Iran. So the fact is that the administration's strategy uh, is uh, in the process of failing just eight months into the administration as Iran every day Goes, grows closer to a nuclear weapons capability. Uh, I've long felt that there were only uh, two alternatives to an Iran with nuclear weapons. One was regime change, uh, which we uh, could have facilitated had we done almost anything in the Bush administration to support Iranian dissidents, which we didn't. The opportunity, uh, the outrage uh, felt uh, obviously across the country in Iran because of the fraudulent June 12 presidential election has now passed, uh, and indeed I think the possibility of regime change in the short term in a, in a period that would affect the nuclear weapons program is now essentially over because, as I said before, power is moving to the people with the guns, the IRGC and its, uh, and its affiliates. Uh, so that leaves the possibility of preemptive military force against Iran's nuclear program. This is an extraordinarily unattractive option, uh, but it's on the table because the other uh, option. The other viable alternative, Iran with nuclear weapons, is even less attractive. Uh, I can virtually guarantee the Obama administration will not do anything uh, in the military area, which puts the entire onus for this decision on Israel. Uh, looking at past uh, practice, Israel has not hesitated when it faced an existential threat. It destroyed Saddam Hussein's Osirak reactor outside of Baghdad in 1981. In September of 2007, it destroyed that North Korean reactor in Syria. Uh, so uh, I think now for the next six, nine months, the spotlight is very much going to be on uh, Israel and what the decision they make. Uh, th this is going to come as a shock to the Obama administration uh, when it happens uh, because the administration has been pursuing an essentially European policy with respect to Israel based on the analysis that if you could only solve the Israeli-Palestinian problem, uh, sweetness and light would break out in the Middle East and all of the other issues we face uh, would become easier to solve, including Iran's nuclear weapons program. In fact, the analysis is very nearly the opposite. It's Iran's continuing support for terrorist groups like Hamas, Hezbollah, terrorists in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq as well as its pursuit of nuclear weapons that's the principal source of risk and instability uh, in the region as a whole. Uh, but nonetheless, the administration continues to pressure Israel 
uh, for example, to stop settlement activity on the West Bank, I think it's fair to say in terms of time, energy, rhetoric, and diplomatic uh, uh, effort that more time has been spent pressuring Israel to stop building settlements than pressuring Iran to stop its nuclear weapons program. So you, you can see the direction that that's, uh, that that's going in. Uh, there, there are a whole host of issues that we could cover here. The uh, issue of how to deal with uh, Russia and the so-called reset button, as I mentioned, how to deal with uh, China, an enormous problem, how to deal with Hugo Chavez in this hemisphere, where the administration has gone wrong in uh, its, uh, the, the steps it's taken that have, I think, gravely impaired our capability to gather human intelligence around the world by uh, declassifying hundreds of pages of documents that now explain what our interrogation techniques are, what we do, what we don't do what's been successful, all of which I'm sure went right into al-Qaeda uh, training manuals. Uh, we've seen the administration at a time of the, the, the grossest profligacy of domestic spending in our history, uh, imposing essentially a ceiling on the Defense Department uh, and a zero-sum analysis that wherever expenditures increase in the defense budget, there have to be offsetting reductions while we're spending wh whatever the number is now, $800 billion dollars, uh, in stimulus on domestic plans that include every idea apparently that's ever been in a file cabinet in a bureaucracy in Washington. Uh, we're uh, hesitating and pulling back on missile defense. Uh, we're not uh, making decisions on uh, new generations of uh, weapon systems, canceling the F-22, unable to decide on the next generation aerial refueling tanker, and the list goes on and on. I tell you, this is a very depressing uh, record to date in mere eight months, uh, and I don't see any prospect uh, that it's going to improve. Even where the Obama administration has pursued policies that have looked somewhat like uh, the previous administration or that conform to what, in my view, is the right approach to defending American interests around the world, it has done so grudgingly uh, and with the clear implication that absent political uh, constraints, it would have done something different. So I understand why Americans are concerned about our economy, why we want to get back on the road to recovery. I understand any new president is going to have his own domestic priorities, uh, in this case uh, restructuring our health care system. But let's be clear, our adversaries around the world uh, are not standing idly by while we debate these domestic issues. Our uh, focus on uh, whether or not there should be a public uh, insurance option in health care uh, is a very important issue. But fundamentally, people like Kim Jong-il don't care where we come out on it, although I suspect he favors the public option. <laughs> we, we need a president who's going to provide us with leadership uh, in international affairs, not a president who believes uh, that America should come home, but believes that the best place to defend our interest is overseas rather than in the streets of America. Thank you very much. So, so as Jenny said, I'd, I'd be happy to answer uh, questions, and I think there are microphones out in the audience if, if you could raise your hand and then just identify yourself uh, uh, when the microphone comes to you. Yes, sir? Right, right here? Hi, my name is, can you, is this on? Yeah. My name is Terry Cook, and first of all, I was wondering where your teleprompter set up, because I, I noticed that you didn't, you were looking, but... Uh, anyway, your first point, I think it was very telling, and if you discount that this president, if you stop assuming that the president is doing what you would want to do, protect American interests, and say, well, America is not exceptional, it's not a big priority to protect America, then if you take that next step, what would you think or project that his mission, that he might think his mission as the president might be? Well, you know, I, I think uh, that the, the, the corollary to the idea that uh, America is not an exceptional country is that the voices of others 
uh, whether they be friends or adversaries, have a, should have a greater weight in um, uh, determining what the outcome should be. Now, I, I've always thought an American president should be an aggressive advocate of our interest. That doesn't mean that he ignores friends and allies uh, like, uh, like, like, a, like a good uh, lawyer. He doesn't ignore the reality that, uh, that he deals in and recognizes that you can't always get everything that you want, that there have to be um, at times concessions and accommodations, but at least you understand what your objective is. If your objective is uh, not to offend anybody, uh, to try and have everybody get a little piece, sort of like, you know, elementary school field day where every third grader gets a medal. If, if that's your idea of the proper uh, structuring of the international environment, then, then, then I think we're going to be in difficulty. And I'll just give you a contemporary example of how I think this plays out. Uh, and that is the uh, recent decision uh, by the government of Scotland or the government of the United Kingdom, you can take your pick uh, where the decision was made to release the convicted uh, 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 bomber of uh, Pan Am 103, Al Megrahi, to release him to Libya. Now, th this is a situation where uh, of the 270 people who were murdered by this terrorist, 189 were Americans, many of them university students uh, on their way home in December of 1988 to celebrate Christmas with their families. Uh, the, the decision uh, to turn McGrahi over to Scottish jurisdiction was accomplished by an agreement the U.S., the U.K., and Libya reached where uh, we agreed that the prosecution would be uh, under Scottish law since the plane fell on Lockerbie in Scotland, um, and on the condition that the Libyans insisted that the prosecution not constitute an, an attack on the interest of the Libyan state, uh, which many people interpreted as meaning the prosecutor should prosecute Megrahi and the other person who was turned over and not try and prove Gaddafi was responsible for the decision to blow the plane out of the sky, number one. And number two, by the U.S. agreeing that the prosecution would be under Scottish law, uh, that meant that the maximum penalty uh, defendants could receive would be life in prison. In, in other words, the U.S. was giving up the option for the death penalty. Now, many people thought that was a reasonable deal at the time because we got McGrahi into custody. And I don't question that uh, for present purposes. I simply use it to show that that guy wouldn't have been in a Scottish jail but for uh, American agreement. And in fact, at the time, one of the proposals was that if uh, McGrahi uh, was convicted, he would, uh, he would serve time in a UN prison. And the victims of the families in this country said, no way. If he, if he is convicted, he, he, we want him to serve in a Scottish jail, not a UN prison, not a Libyan jail, uh, and, and, and that was agreed to as well. So my point by reciting this history is the United States and the victims' families in particular have a huge interest in the status of McGrahi. Uh, and it's inconceivable to me uh, at a time of uh, global Obama mania uh, and with our closest ally in the whole world that if the president hadn't said to Gordon Brown, you cannot allow this man to be released that the British would have allowed him to go. It's inconceivable to me if the president felt strongly about it. And I think what happened uh, was that we probably made a pro forma objection, but the president didn't want to offend anybody. Didn't want to offend the Libyans, that might offend other people in the Middle East, didn't want to press the British. Probably didn't care that much about it, honestly. Probably didn't care, that, probably more concerned about health care reform than the fate of El Megrahi. That is an example of being post-American. Well, why should you be so concerned about the feelings of the families of the 189 uh, American victims? Uh, Eleven Scotsmen were killed on the ground when the plane crashed, and the Scottish government decided they wanted to show compassion for McGrahi. Well, you know, it all works out, doesn't it? That this, this is not what an American president should do. And, and uh, Senator Lautenberg of New Jersey has called for a congressional investigation. He's written Senator Kerry, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I think we ought to have it and have it soon and find out what did the president know and what did he do about it. Yes, sir, in the back. 
Howard Segermark. Uh, John, was it a good idea to send Clinton to North Korea? Are there adverse effects, and what would you have done? Yeah, I, I didn't think it was a good idea. Uh, I thought that uh, uh, even if, as the two reporters have admitted, they were briefly inside North Korea, that was no warrant for the North Koreans to grab them, hold them, sentence them to uh, 10 or 12 years at hard labor. Uh, they should have been given a slap on the wrist and they should have been sent back out of the country. So the North Korean decision to seize these two reporters uh, was a, was to me, was an act of state terrorism and with a clear political agenda. This wasn't a simple law enforcement, border, immigration, customs matter. Uh, now, we've had a policy in this country for decades, bipartisan policy, against negotiating with terrorists. And the reason we've had that policy is we don't want to do anything that increases the incentives for terrorists to grab Americans and hold them hostage. I think that is a sensible policy. Uh, obviously, part of the leverage that North Korea or a terrorist uh, group has over us is the absolutely understandable human compassion we feel for the Americans who are being uh, incarcerated. But a president has a responsibility while trying to free those who have been captured not to endanger other Americans more in the future. And by getting former President Clinton to go to North Korea, uh, I think that that's exactly the message that we were sending, quite apart from the legitimacy that it uh, gave uh, Kim Jong-il. Uh, you may have thought, and I may have thought, that President Clinton looked decidedly unhappy standing there next to Kim Jong-il, uh, but, but for uh, PR purposes, there he was. Not quite as good as uh, Madeleine Albright clinking champagne glasses with Kim Jong-il as she did in 2000, but good enough for government work in this case. Um, we now see the consequences, or at least it follows from, from that, what, what's happened in other situations. Senator Webb goes to Burma in order to get out the American who was uh, convicted of trying to visit Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, I think the Burmese, uh, who have their own collaboration with North Korea, at least on conventional weapons, and Secretary Clinton herself even said perhaps in the nuclear field, uh, saw the benefit and applied it uh, uh, very soon thereafter. We've got three American backpackers who, for reasons best known to them, were hiking in the border area between Iraq and Iran, grabbed by Iranian authorities. They're now in Tehran uh, and, and uh, being used as bargaining chips, along with other Americans that the Iranians have held incommunicado for some time. So, so now we're in a situation where you have to ask yourself, what American is not important enough for Bill Clinton to go and rescue if their captors demand that that's the price of getting it? Uh, as I say, I think an American president has a responsibility to get our people out of jeopardy, whether they were foolish in getting themselves in trouble or whether uh, it was not their fault at all. But that responsibility has to be exercised in a way that doesn't increase a jeopardy for the, the millions of other Americans who travel abroad every year as well. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Bob Schnabel. Uh, I have an interest in Honduras uh, and the support that our government has provided to their deposed president uh, in spite of the fact that he was in the process of disregarding their constitution. Uh, can you grade the president's uh, efforts in that respect? Yeah, F, no question about it. I mean, this, this, is, this is a disgrace for the United States. This is an absolute disgrace. Uh, the, the Honduran constitution, like, like constitutions in many Latin American countries, provides one term for their president. And the reason for that is their historical concern about caudillos, strongmen, men on white horses, uh, getting themselves uh, elected and then deciding this is a pretty good deal, they don't want to leave. And what uh, Zelaya was trying to do was, through uh, a referendum mechanism and otherwise, change the Constitution uh, impermissibly so that he could remain in power. Uh, I don't think we know uh, fully how much Hugo Chavez was supporting this effort, but I don't think there's any doubt that he was, as he has in other countries, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, Peru as he tried to interfere in the recount in the most recent Mexican presidential election. 
And the other legitimate authorities in Honduras tried to react to what was going on. It is surely the strangest military coup in the world where the Supreme Court orders the military to carry it out, the National Congress approves, and the next person in line constitutionally to succeed the president when a vacancy occurs takes office. Uh, and yet, with, with no hesitation that I could tell, we were right there with Danny Ortega of Nicaragua and Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro condemning this effort by the Honduran uh, people and government to, to avoid having another Hugo Chavez put in power there. Even more remarkable than that is that most recently in, in announcing cutoffs of foreign assistance to what is, after all, the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, the State Department indicated it might not even respect the outcome of a free and fair election later this fall where neither Zelaya nor Micheletti would compete. That, just incredible that, uh, that we've taken uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, position. You can only uh, ascribe it to a uh, a rigid kind of ideology uh, that I think reflects uh, very poorly on the United States. It sends a terrible signal to other allies around the world. It sends a terrible signal to the government of Colombia, for example, uh, which is criticized by some on the left in this country for uh, abuses by uh, civil militias that are opposing the narco-terrorists who run much of the country, even though those narco-terrorists are in league with Hugo Chavez being supplied by weapons. Their funding comes from the sale of illegal drugs. You know, when you kick around a tiny country like Honduras uh, uh, in the way that we have, I, I, I think it again leads people to say that, uh, that you have to be careful of having a friend in Washington. In, in the back there. Yeah, my name is Bruce Kaufman. Um, you spoke early about uh, the Obama administration at some point hoping to get back under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court <clears throat> and that there might be some criticism of that. Wouldn't one of the criticisms to the extent that that would put American citizens under the jurisdiction of an international court, wouldn't one of the criticisms be that it's unconstitutional? And second thing, is this another example of post-American? Well, I, I, think that it, I think it is an example of post-Americanism and I think it's part of a long uh, series of efforts by, uh, by uh, people who style themselves as advocates of international human rights to try and constrain the United States. Uh, you know, we, we have the best program in the world, bar none, for training people in our military to obey the laws of war. Uh, we have uh, uh, considerable uh, enforcement capability when our soldiers for, uh, for unacceptable reasons violate our laws, their training and our doctrine. Uh, we don't hesitate to enforce uh, these prohibitions. Uh, we have, uh, I, I would be happy to hold up the American record against any other country in the world. Uh, it is true that sometimes uh, our soldiers uh, do commit uh, uh, crimes that violate our laws. A uh, it, little secret here, uh, our country is made up of human beings uh, who are imperfect, but, but we prosecute them and, and, and we have nothing to be ashamed of. So the notion that we need to subscribe to an international criminal court uh, to help us do it right, I, I think is just fundamentally uh, wrong. Uh, but it's not uh, untypical of a view that our democratic institutions, by and large, are inadequate to the task of, uh, of governing ourselves as, as a people. And uh, it, it's because of a, I think, a very uh, widespread view that, uh, that, that we need broader international norms to govern our conduct, that our decisions alone through our elected representatives are not enough. So I'll give you an example from just within about the past four or five weeks. Uh, you know, we have in this country a statute called the Americans with Disabilities Act. It is our way of dealing with uh, uh, citizens with disabilities and, and uh, protecting them against uh, discrimination. You can agree or disagree with this or that aspect of it. I'm, I'm simply saying we have in Congress at the federal level uh, had a public debate on it. We've had votes and that's, that's the outcome of our constitutional system. Four or five uh, weeks ago, Susan Rice, the ambassador to the UN and 
um, uh, representatives from the White House signed a convention in New York uh, that's an international convention on people with disabilities. Uh, now, I can't myself understand what the international policy implication of people with disability is. It may be on international airplane flights and things like that. There are, there are things that, uh, that, uh, that require addressing, and if so, so be it. But that's not what this convention says. It's part of a long line of conventions like the Convention on the Rights of the Child or the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and a series of others that basically say, well, you know, it's true in the United States you've debated these issues and uh, you've come to your own conclusion, but, but you need international norms that you can continue to advance toward. And I, I just, I, I think this propensity to take decision making out of the hands of elected representatives and put them in the hands of diplomats first, who then create treaties that are brought back and presented to the Senate for ratification is a very dangerous precedent. But I think we're gonna see a lot more of it in this administration once they fix our health care system and can turn to other things, uh, you're going to see more and more of this kind of activity. I think it's a, it's a considerable risk to us. I think it betrays a lack of faith in the uh, strength and validity of our constitutional structures, and I think it's something we should be more concerned about. Yes, sir, down here. Thank you. Uh, Scott Schulman, thank you uh, for being here today. I got a hundred questions, but um, how how c could you keep your sanity doing what you did at the UN? Um, and uh, secondly, what do you see as ways that maybe going forward as a country we can get back to where we were? Well, I think I think the uh, I like to say, f you know, if 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 Americans. Uh, could have just joined me in the U.S. mission at the U.N. for 30 days and wandered the hall with us and gone to the meetings and, and just done what we do in New York for 30 days, you would have an amazing view world, countrywide of the United Nations system. Jenny, Jenny was up there for, for a couple of weeks. Well, some, some people might not take 30 days, but... Um, you know, you, you have to, uh, I think you have to, you have to view it in that sense. And I, I thought it was important that, uh, that, that uh, we change the idea at the UN that the United States was just a well-bred doormat. And that, you know, we were, we were prepared to speak up for our interests. Say, say there's something shocking, isn't it? Um, and, and, you know, honestly, I think most of the other diplomats appreciated that because they wanted to know what we really thought. Uh, and they may not agree with it, but it was a lot better to know it and, uh, and to deal with it straight up. Uh, in, in terms of what to do about the country as a whole, I, I think we, uh, I know we're not in a partisan environment here, but I think we need to have a one-term president. Uh, that's the first thing to do to, uh, to change it because, um, you know, the, 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 there's nobody else in the world that's going to stand up for American interest if we don't. And uh, when you have, if my analysis is right, and this is a post-American president, we've got uh, 40 months to go, uh, where I think a lot of difficulties are going to uh, are going to develop, and that aren't going to be cured uh, automatically simply by electing another president. These budget decisions that are being made in the Pentagon, the cancellation of weapon systems, uh, the deterioration of our intelligence gathering capability, th these these decisions will cause problems that will take years to fix. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 I, and I think the, we, we can only hope that, uh, that our adversaries uh, are, are not in a position uh, to take advantage of the weaknesses that we're developing. Yeah, over here. Hang, hang on a second. Sure. You, you've talked skeptically about the value of uh, sanctions uh, and skeptically about military force. What do you think the pros and cons are of a militarily enforced uh, blockade of refined oil plot, uh, products uh, as opposed to simply sanctions? I know that some people would say that's an act of war, but how would you evaluate the pros and cons of that compared to the alternatives? Well, if, uh, if the Europeans were willing, <laughs> uh, and I, I wouldn't hold my breath on that, um, 
you know, you could have, well, I mean, we, we could impose a military blockade ourselves, but, but presumably uh, you would want others to, to join in. The fact is you're never going to get a Security Council resolution that endorses that. You're not even going to get the sanctions to begin with out of the Security Council, let alone an authorization to use force. So that means that um, it would simply be by the say-so, in effect, of whatever countries participated in uh, the military activity. And uh, I don't think, I can't think of a country today that would do that. I cannot believe this administration would do it on its own. Um, I think what they're going to do, uh, what I'm more worried about is, given the, uh, the failure of their policy on Iran, which, which simply becomes more evident with every passing day, that they will find a way to accept uh, the Iranian nuclear program continuing under the guise that it is frozen and declare that as a victory and then go on and try and reform some other sector of our domestic economy, when the fact is that's an utterly unverifiable commitment or agreement by the Iranians, and it simply means they will continue toward their breakout capability with nuclear weapons. That, that's why I thought, uh, I, I would have said strict sanctions like, uh, like uh, banning the importation of refined petroleum products was a good idea about six years ago. But we wasted that period of time in the Bush administration, allowing our friends in Europe to try everything in their imagination to convince the Iranians to give up their uranium enrichment program, which the Iranians have made clear over and over again they're just not going to do. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Can you speak a bit about what um, the administration's seeming hesitancy on missile defense means for our relationship with NATO allies in Central and Eastern Europe? Yeah. I, I think uh, many people in the administration just don't believe missile defense will work, number one. They've never believed it, uh, despite the continuing growing body of, uh, of evidence that we can make it work. Um, I think the uh, missile defense has become so neuralgic with the Russians that it's part of the reset button idea that we can you know, we'll cooperate with the Russians on their concerns on missile defense, and that'll make the Russians help us on Iran. I mean, it's, it's, this is like kindergarten kind of uh, logic, but I think that's part of it. And I think the, uh, you know, the irony here is that where many in NATO uh, at the time we were trying to get out of the ABM Treaty of 1972 believed that our pursuit of missile defense would be strategically destabilizing, now understand why we were right all along, uh, and that the threat uh, from rogue states with limited numbers of uh, nuclear weapons is precisely what missile defense should guard against. We're, we, we've now gotten all the Europeans on board for that. We've gotten the Czech Republic and, and Poland to agree to put uh, sightings for, for radars and missiles in their countries, and now we're going to pull the rug out from under them. And again, it's going to lead uh, people all over the world to say, what is the uh, what is the advantage of signing on with the Americans here? It will cause enormous concern in Eastern Europe about uh, the uh, administration's willingness to stand up uh, to continued Russian belligerence, which I think is the only way you can describe their policy. After all, if you go back to August of 2008, when the Russians invaded Georgia, the first reaction of candidate Obama was to call on both sides to exercise restraint. That's balance. This is, this is my, you know, above the world president. Balance. Georgia, now you exercise restraint. And Russia, you exercise restraint. So I'm even handed, right? I mean, th this is, uh, if, if I were an Eastern European, I'd be very worried. Yes, sir. Uh, John Gordon. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, puzzled by an apparent paradox between a neo-isolationist attitude on the part of the administration and yet their willingness to acquiesce to control from uh, various foreign bodies like the International Criminal Court and so on. And I just, I guess I'm wondering what motivates them. Is it a, is it a loyalty to their voting constituency? Is it a competition for resources between international interests and domestic interests, or is it just an ideological uh, bent that cannot be changed? Well, I, th I think in part it's, uh, uh, it, it's a reflection of a, of a deep-seated uh, uh, discomfort with American power uh, and the, the way that American power has been used around the world. Even Let's go back to the case of Afghanistan, the so-called good war 
well, now they've got a president, they've got majorities in both houses of Congress, and the good war doesn't look so good to them. That, that uh, you know, you, you then have to ask, well, what, 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 where is the case where we use American force to defend our interest? If, if it, first you said it was Afghanistan, now it's not Afghanistan, where, where exactly is it? And, and I think that's a, that's a major part of the problem. I think also, um, it is a, a philosophical reflection of a view widely held in Europe that the problems Europe faced in the 20th century were caused by national sovereignties. And the answer for many people in Europe uh, to the threat posed by national sovereignty is abolishing national sovereignty. So many on the European left in particular over the past decades have been uh, reducing their national autonomy, shoveling authority toward uh, Brussels in the in the form of the European Union and its bureaucracy, uh, and I think a lot of Europeans would like to shovel a little of our sovereignty toward international institutions as well. So if you don't feel comfortable with American power to begin with, uh, locking it into institutions that can constrain it uh, really is a way of protecting us against ourselves in their view. So if you if you um, if you followed that, if you go back to uh, the war in the Balkans, for example, in the late 1990s, the UN Secretary General at the time, Kofi Annan, said that Security Council authorization is required. It's the only way you can legitimately exercise force in the world. Um, and I think there are a lot of people in Europe who believe that. I think there are a lot of people on the American left who believe it. They're just afraid to say it. But if, if you got people actually to believe that, obviously we would be dramatically constrained in what we could do to protect our own interests around the world. Uh, and the more treaties we have, the lower our levels of nuclear weapons that we agree with the Russians, uh, uh, which the administration is eagerly pursuing, hopes to have a treaty by the end of this year, uh, the less able we are to cause trouble. Now, we know a lot of other people in the world agree with that, but I think that instinct, not that they would ever say it, but that discomfort with American strength uh, is, uh, is evident in a lot of places in this country, too. Why don't I take just one more question, if I could. Yes, sir, over here. Doug Wisey, can you see a connection uh, in foreign policy with our uh, government's stance vis-a-vis -vis the uh, situation in Mexico with the drug cartel violence? and now they're trying to blame it upon us uh, and uh, the transport of weapons across the border. I foresee a further um, attack upon our Second Amendment rights in all this myself. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think you're quite right to be concerned, and, and the idea that, uh, that the drug cartels and the violence in Mexico is because they're buying guns from the United States uh, as opposed to the hundreds of other places around the world they could buy them, uh, is really fairly uh, remarkable. And, uh, you know, it harkens back to uh, uh, Gene Kirkpatrick's uh, famous speech at the 1984 Republican National Convention, where she talked, uh, it was in Dallas, but the Democrats had met previously in San Francisco, uh, Speaker Pelosi, and Gene talked about the San Francisco Democrats uh, and their views, and, and she said, they always blame America first. And here was another example in the Mexican uh, uh, drug situation, um, uh, because there's no doubt that, uh, that a lot of the gun control groups in this country, frustrated at their inability to get uh, the system they want at the federal and state level, have tried to internationalize the effort. This is another one of these norming exercises where they want to get an international treaty that every other country in the world agrees to, even though half of them agree to it and then ignore it. But they would bring that back to the Senate and say, we don't want the U.S. to be isolated. You need to pass this, and, uh, and, and we would have gun control brought in indirectly. You know, one of, the, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the most controversial things I said when I was in the Bush administration was in 2001 at one of these U.N. conferences uh, on, it was called on small arms and light weapons, uh, where I said the United States is not going to agree to any international convention that if enacted as positive law in our country would violate our Constitution. Well, I mean, you would have thought I would said something really terrible um, because they knew exactly what that meant, that we weren't going to uh, permit infringement on Second Amendment rights or, or, or any others for that matter. And I think that's why this 
issue of sovereignty and the view of what, uh, what, why it's legitimate for us to defend what to me is the essence of sovereignty, which is self-government in the United States. People who say you need to share sovereignty with international organizations or other countries are really saying Americans have too much control over their own government and they need to give some of it up. I'm uh, hum humbly of the view we don't have enough control over our own government. I don't want to give up what little we have. So this is uh, uh, th th this is, I think, uh, emblematic of, uh, of, a, of a strain of thought in American life, and I think it's one that uh, is very near nearly controlling uh, in the Obama administration. Thanks again. Thank you all very much. <laughs>